Hi, this is Dr. Bernstein with the May 2021 edition of uh, Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes University. Uh, before we get started, I have a request to make. Um, Dave Dykeman, who is with his son, uh, Dave the uh, Third, co-producer of uh, these videos, recently congratulated me on the two millionth view of our Diabetes University. And that sounded great until you start looking at the arithmetic. With two million views of about 200 videos, you're down to maybe 2,000 individuals, which, I'm sorry, 20,000 individuals. So there are somewhere around 20,000 people watching my videos over time on average. Compared to the 20 to 30 million diabetics and pre-diabetics in the country, that is the USA, and probably uh, quadruple that worldwide, people worldwide who have computers, um, what we're achieving is just a grain of sand on the beach. We're, we're actually getting information to very, very few people compared to the total number of diabetics. So we could use help. Uh, if there's a viewer who's uh, a professional at uh, internet publicity who is willing to volunteer to help us, we can't afford to pay anyone. Uh, the two producers that we currently have are not getting paid. I'm not getting paid. The royalties on the book are uh, split a few ways and uh, quite meager. Uh, so we need some free help to get more exposure of these videos. Uh, we don't charge for the videos and we uh, really could use some uh, no cost help. Thank you so much. Um, for today's, uh, before we would answer today's questions, I want to remind everybody that my answers are generalized answers that were created for the benefit of the listening audience and may not be the exact solution to the problem that, the, that an individual has posed. Uh, I, I'm not doing a physical exam on the uh, questioner. I'm not getting a complete medical history. And I might add that when people try to give us a complete history by sending in uh, two or three pages of text, uh, we don't even look at those questions because we don't have the time to read them. Uh, we're asking for just uh, a few lines uh, of question uh, and we screen out the lengthy ones. So, um, uh, the chances that I have the correct exact answer to your question uh, are probably small. Remember the answers are for educating the listenership. Before we begin our questions, we're going to look at a couple of articles that came out recently. Um, April 21 in the New England of oh, 2021, uh, that's the 21st of 2021, in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, there's an article, a study that shows that um, the COVID-19 COVID uh, messenger RNA vaccine that's, uh, that was tested uh, is safe to use during pregnancy. There's been a lot of interest in this question and uh, uh, if you're interested, take a look at the April 20 and 21st 
uh, New England Journal, and you can see the details of the study. On April 25th, 2021, an article was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association uh, looking at dementia in type 2 diabetics. And this was a large study, 10,000 people in Denmark. And what they found was that the longer these people had diabetes, the more likely they would develop dementia. A very strong correlation with the length of time with type 2 diabetes and the incidence of dementia. So this just reiterates the fact that high blood sugars damage the brain. We had over the past maybe five or 10 years seen many articles about damage to the brain, brains of children by high blood sugars. And now people are looking at older people with type two diabetes. These people, individuals were all over the age of 37 at the start of the study and they were followed since 1985 through 88. So the, it was a long-term study performed in Denmark. Now we can get down to our questions. I'm a 53 year old woman, 40 of them is a type one diabetic. Doing my best to be uh, close to your instructions. My A1C is 5.6%. I have high cholesterol, 285, LDL 193, HDL 69, and triglycerides 117. My coronary artery calcium score is zero. Uh, this particular question actually reiterates what I've been what I've been pointing out over the past uh, many years, namely that cholesterol is not a predictor of heart disease. Uh, here this person uh, with a low, with a zero coronary artery calcium score, no plaque in the coronary arteries, had a high cholesterol, but since cholesterol has no relation to coronary artery disease, in reality, we all know about the cholesterol myth, uh, one would expect would not expect to have a high calcium score based upon cholesterol, nor based upon uh, this person's LDL. Uh, however, her triglycerides were quite normal, and that is a risk factor, 117, and her HDL, which is protective, uh, and therefore a negative predictor of heart disease, was 69, which is a uh, little higher than the average in the USA. Um, and uh, it just jibes with the zero coronary artery calcium score. Um, so she's asking, uh, does she have to worry about her high cholesterol? And of course, the answer is no. And you could uh, read up on the, on the internet journal articles on the cholesterol myth. With skipping daily dinners, I have improved my gastroparesis and even lost a little weight in the last few months. I am obese, but I am concerned if I continue, it will slow my metabolism and make weight, weight loss more difficult to maintain in the future. Please advise. Well, first of all, um, I'd like to quote what Yogi Berra could have called, told me many years ago. What works, works. Um, if eating less, especially less dinner, uh, is helping you to lose weight, 
uh, and making your gastroparesis better, uh, uh, keep keep doing it. You have to, however, be very careful not to undereat protein, which is what many people who are dieting tend to do. Uh, you need protein to preserve uh, your muscle mass and also to maintain many of your organs. You need the amino acids for protein, for peptide hormones, uh, etc. So your body needs proteins. And uh, if you just skip a major meal, you may be getting too little protein. Uh, we have discussed on uh, my videos um, uh, how to compute uh, protein needs, uh, and I'm not going to go into detail now. My daughter is five years old and honeymooning. She can eat an apple and no blood sugar rise. Is eating an apple okay then? Well, I thought I free associated to an equivalent uh, action, taking a sulfonylurea. You may recall that the sulfonylurea drugs work by pushing the beta cells to make more insulin and that uh, the manufacturers admit that they only work for uh, on average two years. What they don't admit is that the reason the sulfonylureas stop working after two years is because the beta cells are burned out from overworking. So if you're going to give her an apple and overwork her beta cells uh, trying to uh, repeatedly cover apples, um, you're going to, my guess is that you're eventually going to burn them out. Non-diabetics spike to 140 milligrams per deciliter and sometimes as high as 180 after meals. So why should I be shooting for 80 milligrams per deciliter before, during, and after meals. Well, the numbers that you just gave are numbers for the uh, typical American diet. Um, they're not the meals that humans evolved on. These high carbohydrate meals with simple sugars um, uh, uh, grains, uh, and so on, uh, were not available to our ancestors several thousand years ago before our agriculture. And we evolved over a long period of time when humans were hunter-gatherers, not farmers, not growing wheat, not growing rice, and certainly not uh, uh, consuming uh, simple sugars. So uh, if you want to look at what happens to normal people, look at people who are eating normal or natural diets, not those who are eating the typical American diet. What do type one children suffer from? No, why do type one su uh, children suffer from stunted growth when blood sugars are very high? Well, there's probably a number of reasons, biochemical reasons going on simultaneously. Now, uh, these kids with high blood sugars usually uh, are not making enough insulin. And insulin is what's called an anabolic hormone. It builds fat and it builds muscle. And uh, not only in the absence of insulin, amino acids coming from muscle get converted to glucose and with the high blood sugars, you pee away that glucose in, in the urine. So 
high blood sugars would be causing a kid to pee their muscle mass into the urine. And that's just what happened to me when I was first diagnosed with diabetes. I was um, 11 years old, weighed 100 pounds. And uh, before they actually made the diagnosis, while I was drinking and peeing, uh, my weight went down by 20%. I went down to 80 pounds. So I was peeing my muscles away. And um, uh, I did not end up very tall. In fact, I ended up always the shortest one in my class. And uh, when I was in college and we had 750 people in the class, um, I think I was still the shortest one in the class, but I was also the youngest one. With skipping daily, no, I've seen that, okay. Does being fat cause insulin resistance or does having insulin resistance make you fat? My guess is that it's both, but I think it's mostly being fat causing insulin resistance. However, the two are, are happening simultaneously. And uh, as of this moment, I have several people, new patients who have come to me who are very fat and require a lot of insulin. And what we're trying to do is use both dietary and other tricks to get their insulin doses down so to facilitate weight loss. Um, and uh, the game plan seems to be working. Uh, I just spoke to someone yesterday uh, actually, I spoke to her today. She's taking a hundred units, over a hundred units of insulin daily, um, which is a very large dose. And um, uh, we're working on getting both the insulin dose down and uh, her blood sugars down and her weight down. Please help me understand the world of diabetes. On the one hand, I see that A1Cs amongst type 1 children are higher than ever. On the other hand, I now see the ADA lowering their A1C guidelines due to the admission that hyperglycemia damages the brain and shortens lifespan. Wow. Well, maybe the, this person wants to know why the ADA uh, uh, still is pushing carbohydrate, uh, even though they recognize that the high blood sugars da damage the brain. Um, uh, and also the fact that um, most endocrinologists are still pushing high blood sugars and even uh, high carbohydrate in the diet. I suspect that the reason endocrinologists are pushing this is because they don't have time to read the scientific literature and realize that um, the high blood sugars are damaging brains. They probably know by now that the high blood sugars uh, stunt growth. Um, the American Diabetes Association, on the other hand, uh, cannot all of a sudden turn around and uh, uh, to take a look at the US government, can't turn around and tell and admit to everybody that there are UFOs. So um, uh, normal blood sugars are the UFOs of the, of the ADA. They uh, uh, can't uh, all of a sudden admit that uh, there are no, that normal blood sugars are desirable. If insulin is the fat storage hormone, 
and dietary fat doesn't raise insulin, shouldn't I be able to eat all the butter I want? Well, I don't know where you got this in information. Um, uh, you probably have not been listening to my videos. Uh, any nutrient will cause the production of amylin in the intestines. And if you're capable of making insulin, amylin will stimulate the pancreas uh, to make more insulin whether it's uh, butter that you're eating or anything that distends the gut. So you eat a, if you're a diabetic and, in, and uh, well, if you're not, if you're non-diabetic and you eat a handful of pebbles, you're going to make um, GLP-1, which will tell the pancreas uh, to make insulin, glucagon, amylin, uh, et cetera. And uh, so uh, eating butter uh, will stimulate the production of insulin. Can you please demonstrate on camera how to give painless injections? Well, we've done this already. If you search uh, Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes University, you'll find a video entitled giving painless insulin injections. And I give both subcutaneous and intramuscular shots on myself. Oh boy, here's the tough one. <laughs> I never miss a teleseminar and love your personal stories. Please tell us your favorite movie, show, book, music, etc. Okay, <laughs> I'll give it a try. Um, my favorite movie is A Night at the Opera with the Marx Brothers. Uh, my favorite book is The Hobbit by Tolkien. Um, probably my favorite, um, uh, TV show was Sid Caesar's Your Show of Shows. Um, and, uh, my favorite artist is Maxfield Parrish, uh, Parrish who was an illustrator in the early part of the 20th century. And um, I actually managed to procure many years ago two of his uh, Mazda calendars uh, of beautiful um, uh, women uh, that are probably now worth quite, quite valuable. Um, in terms of uh, entertainers, um, I uh, especially like Stanley Holloway, um, also Sir Harry Lauder, um, singers, uh, they were both singers, so I should have said singers. Stanley Holloway, Harry Lauder, Gertrude Lawrence, Cliff Edwards, also known as Ukulele Ike, and also known as Jiminy Cricket in uh, Disney movies, uh, and Cesare Sieppi, who is a basso. Um, in terms of poetry, uh, I go for Albert and the Lion, uh, which you could look up on the internet. Um, and as far as uh, composers go, uh, I like um, uh, Claude Debussy, um, Maurice Ravel, and Imre Kalman, 
who was Hungarian. Um, let's see if there's anything else. Uh, my side interests um, especially uh, include uh, mathematics and, phys and physics. Um, I would have liked to have been a physicist, but um, I uh, had severe hypothyroidism in college uh, with accompanying dementia and didn't think I was smart enough to compete with uh, people who became classmates who became world famous. Uh, I frequently hear registered dietitians push back on low carb by using studies that slow that show growth is slowed on very low carb in therapeutic ketogenic diets well first of all i don't remember seeing any growth studies on very low carb diets can you discuss why you your approach with 11 kids no with type 1 kids is different and how the kids you know uh, do as uh, far as growth and development go. Um, the kids that uh, I am currently treating are all growing very rapidly. Um, we do have problems uh, with growth hormone levels as they uh, uh, get through growth spurts because um, when they're making a lot of growth hormone, their blood sugars go up. And the problem is that the growth hormone is not the same from one day to the next. So um, we'll get um, spikes of growth co combined with sp spikes of blood sugar, which poses a problem. Um, but uh, all of the patients uh, I treat uh, seem to grow taller than their parents. I am 200 pounds overweight. How do I lose weight and should I begin exercise? What is the right way to start being more active? Well, my wife who was, my late wife who was a psychiatrist, um, when her overweight patients asked her, what kind of exercise should I do? She said, the first exercise you do is pushing the plate away. And I would reiterate that um, to go into further detail, you could read my book, Diabetes Solution. Is there value in testing the cholesterol panel of a 10 year old? I think you should be, unlike many of the endos that we encounter, you should be normalizing blood sugars and certainly not looking at uh, total serum cholesterol, which is not a marker, uh, not an adverse marker of anything. So um, concentrate on the blood sugars and you'll uh, be more likely to preserve their cerebral function, their growth and their general well-being. Do you use alcohol, alcohol swabs before you test? How often do you change your Lancet? Um, once I started doing basal bolus dosing and taking multiple shots a day, which I pioneered back in 1970, um, I stopped using alcohol swabs for that for for insulin vials and for my skin. However, uh, I did I was 
at that time working in New York City. And I found that when I came home from work, if I wiped my forehead and my nose with an alcohol swab, the swab would turn black. So I would come home with soot all over my face. In those days, there was no control over the uh, sm the smokestack emissions and in incinerators in New York City. So alcohol swabs have a very uh, uh, good use in keeping the soot off, getting the soot off your face. Uh, they do not sterilize anything. Um, if your uh, hands are dirty, uh, you should wash them with soap and water before a finger stick. Um, uh, it's not necessary to wipe insulin vials with an alcohol swab. I've never gotten an infection from an injection. And um, I might add that before I learned how to control my blood sugars, I got frequent skin infections, but not at injection sites. Um, I would get boils uh, under my chin and on my face, and etc. Et ah, and how how often do you change your lancets? I change a lancet when it gets dull. What are your thoughts on stem cell therapies for type one, as far as a likely cure? Um, I sometimes get phone calls from people who have had stem cell therapies. Um, and sometimes I read studies of stem cell therapies. And thus far, I've not seen any reports of stem cell therapies that really uh, cure diabetes where A1Cs are normal um, and where the stem cells last. Um, I got a, um, a phone call the other day from a lady whom I did not know who whose first stem cell treatment didn't stopped working and then had a second one and that stopped working and um, uh, I, I don't know how much she paid for these treatments, but uh, I certainly would not advocate them at this point in time. I have an A1C of 5.1. I now use Traceba and Novo Rapid. I think I can do better with regular insulin, but the doctors don't think this is necessary. What should I do? Well, before I became a doctor, I thought that I should decide my treatment and not my doctor who didn't believe, he was by the way, president of the ADA and he did not believe uh, in normalizing blood sugars. In fact, he was afraid of that. Um, so I think that you should do what you can to decide your own fate. And um, uh, if your doctors uh, will not write a prescription for regular insulin um, and you need a prescription, you should find a kindly a uh, family practice doctor who would be willing to uh, write prescriptions for regular insulin. Um, now, that's just my opinion. That doesn't mean that it's necessarily the right thing for you because I don't know um, the rest of your history. Uh, I do know your A1C of 5.1 is probably an average blood sugar of a little over 100 and it sh should be possible to get it a little below 100, maybe in the 80s. I have to take twice as much R as Novolog 
to cover carbs and protein is 8 to 12 units of R a day worse for me than 4 to 6 units of Novolog. It's a much lower quantity of insulin. Well, uh, you probably have not read my book, Diabetes Solution, so that would be the first thing I would advise. Um, uh, and it, it points out that Novolog uh, is about 50% more potent than regular. The manufacturer has not disclosed this to the general public. Um, there may be something about it in the package insert. Um, uh, and uh, as long as we're on the subject, Umalog is about twice as potent as regular insulin. And um, I remember when Umalog first came out and I right away uh, got severe hypoglycemia because the manufacturer indicated you take the same doses as you would for regular. And um, I discovered on my patients that they were experiencing the same thing. And uh, I asked the, the Lily salesman uh, if he was aware of this, and he wasn't. But I told him uh, to ask his uh, sales manager to find out about it. And the answer that I eventually got was that we were recently told about it at a sales meeting, but we were told not to disclose this information unless a doctor has noticed it and asks us about it. So that shows you the kind of things that are going on. Um, uh, neither Umalog nor Novolog are human insulins. They differ from human insulin they are deliberately uh, different in order to make them work more rapidly, even though uh, that's not appropriate for low-carb diets. Um, it might be appropriate for correcting elevated blood sugars, but it's harder to use them to correct elevated blood sugars because uh, they're so hyper, super potent. Um, they can be diluted, however, uh, for correcting elevated blood sugars. I have read many diabetes educators recommend a total daily insulin dose of 0 0.5 units of insulin per kilogram of body weight, which in my case is about 42 units per day. This is significantly higher than the dosages I've heard you discuss in your videos. What is your recommended total daily dose in order to achieve optimum health? Well, it really depends on a lot of things, in particular, uh, the ideal body weight, and also uh, the amount of exercise a person, person gets. You don't want to be breaking down muscle uh, to make glucose, gluconeogenesis. Um, uh, so uh, you have to sort of fine tune the insulin uh, to uh, prevent muscle breakdown. In my experience with my own patients, I find that most of those um, who are relatively sedentary would uh, use about 0 0.4 units per day, but I can't say that this is ideal for health or anything like that. It's just um, uh, what I've seen uh, turn out for most of my patients. And um, 
I also might point out that most of the, um, did you call them nutrition, Di diabetes educators, well, most of, uh, many of the diabetes educators, especially those who are dietitians, are overweight, and um, that may sway uh, uh, what they do vis-a-vis uh, -vis insulin. My daughter is 33 months old, was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. She got her pump for the sake of her result to get better, and I was introduced to the low-carbohydrate, high-protein diet. But even though her results are not getting better with an A1C of 8.7, I am currently reading your book and searching for a big favor and advice from you on how to convince the doctor of using our insulin for her while keeping her under their attention and if there's any solution they're using the pump or do we need to remove it well again i suggest you read my book carefully uh because um uh, i recommend against the use of insulin pumps i show that uh they cause scar tissue to form at the at the insertion sites and um, eventually uh, it becomes impossible to get, to uh, infuse a predictable dose of insulin uh, because of the unpredictable absorption uh, at these scar tissue sites uh, but there are other reasons not to use the pumps such as misinformation that you give boluses for meals that uh, are only dependent upon carbohydrate uh, and so on and so forth. So it's all covered in my book, Diabetes Solution. Since the last six to seven months, every time I go out in the sun or, wear a br or watch a bright screen or go from bright to dark conditions, I see the... I see spots in large numbers, even when my blood sugar is above 140 milligrams per deciliter, and they won't go away. I have visited my eye doctor multiple times, and they say that my eyes are clear, and they will go away, and I should learn to live with them. What are these spots? How do I get rid of them? Also, these are not floaters. Well, um, I would suggest uh, that you um, initially find probably a good retinologist and probably you should get wide angle uh, color photos of uh, your uh, vitreous because there may be floaters um, there are different kinds of spots. Uh, for example, if the if you see pinhead size spots that are black, those might be red blood cells. Um, if you see uh, fairly large uh, gray fuzzy discs, it might be. Uh, due to ischemia, which sometimes occurs when blood sugars are low, but you say that you see this when your blood sugars are high. So um, I cannot tell uh, from uh, your descriptions, but I would say, uh, and also um, 
uh, question is whether it's in both eyes or one eye. Um, if you see the exact same thing in both eyes, uh, identically the same, it could be a central, what, what uh, doctors call a central problem. Um, and uh, uh, that can be fairly serious. In any event, you should see a good retinologist. I have experienced extreme insulin sensitivity when I am at the beach and go into the ocean water. My sugars begin to suddenly drop even when there is no short or rap rapid acting insulin in my system. When I am at a pool where the water isn't fresh, I don't experience any, any sudden sugar drop, only a gradual drop over an extensive period. Could you please elaborate on this for me? Well, uh, I could only uh, speculate. My first guess would be that in the ocean, there are waves and you uh, may have to keep moving in order to avoid getting water in your face or your mouth. Uh, and if you keep moving, that's more likely to lower your blood sugar. Um, why your blood sugar should go lower when you're in the pool, I don't know. Um, uh, the only thing I could think of would be exercise in the ocean. If the ocean were cooler than the pool, however, and you haven't, I don't think you've indicated whether it is or not. If the ocean is cool and it lowers your body temperature, your metabolism speeds up to keep you warm and that could uh, indeed lower your blood sugar. In fact, it reminds me many years ago, I, um, um, many years ago, I was, uh, I took my telescope outside in the wintertime and was looking at some kind of apparition in the sky. And uh, I was out about 20 minutes. And fortunately, my wife came out and insisted that I come in and get a blood sugar. And although the blood sugar was normal when I left the house, 25 minutes later and went back in the house, my blood sugar was in the 30s. So uh, it was a striking reminder that if you're out in the cold and you're shivering, your blood sugar can drop precipitously just from the work, the exercise of shivering. What is euglycemic DKA? My endocrinologist is saying stop following low carb diet, even if your blood sugar is stable on low carb diet, you will get into diabetic ketoacidosis or euglycemic DKA. Uh, this is what I think is a mythical new disease that has been uh, discussed since the availability of a class of drugs called SGLT2 uh, antagonists. These are the drugs that cause uh, the renal threshold for glucose to drop. Renal threshold is the blood sugar level at which the kidneys will start peeing away glucose. And um, 
So let's say that a normal kidney might pee away glucose when blood sugars get uh, over 160. Um, with the SGLT2 inhibitor, which you take, um, no, you can take it, I believe, I believe it's an injectable, but I'm not sure. Um, you might start peeing away glucose at a lower blood sugar, let's say maybe 120 or 130. Now, they've been found, it's been found to increase ketone levels in the blood and doctors have been inappropriately calling it diabetic ketoacidosis. Diabetic ketoacidosis involves very high blood sugars, um, certainly over 300, sometimes as high as 1500, um, and um, severe dehydration. Now, the severe dehydration can occur with the SGLT2 uh, inhibitors because they're causing you to pee a lot and you're instructed if you're taking them to drink a lot of water. And um, uh, so I would guess that yes, if you're taking this drug and you don't drink adequately, um, you can get dehydrated, you can get ketones in your uh, urine and bloodstream, and um, uh, will you show other signs of DKA, uh, such as loss of consciousness, a cerebral edema and whatnot. Uh, I haven't seen reports of it. Uh, it may be possible, but certainly it's not possible for, from a low carbohydrate diet. How is the low carbohydrate going to dehydrate you? Um, uh, you uh, if anything, you, you need more fluid when you're taking a lot of carbohydrates. Um, certainly when your blood sugars are high from the high carbohydrates. So um, I would say that this is a fiction and um, uh, it's not something that is going to be caused by a low carb diet. I've been on the diet since 1970 or thereabouts. Here's a, low, a long question, and I did not cross it out. I guess I had a good reason. Picture a type 1 diabetic person with out-of-control blood sugars, very high and very low, and often so low he passes out to the point where medics must come to give him intravenous glucose. This person going through a low blood sugar episode may say and do unkind things such as pushing, hurting, or yelling at family members, followed by passing out. Is it possible that this person, after they have been revived, may completely forget how they behaved when their blood sugar was low, even though their family members say he pushed, hit, and yelled at them? It is important. That's why I kept the question. <laughs> uh, this happened to me plenty of times before I was able to measure my own blood sugars. And it was one of the reasons why I put such high priority on attempting to get my blood sugar straightened out. Uh, I think I even mentioned in my book that... Um, the effect that my diet, my low blood sugars was having on my family was uh, terrible and that I was desperate to do something to get rid of them. And this is exactly what would happen. Um, uh, I was told of one time that my five-year-old son is trying to get me to... Um, eat something sweet and uh, I pushed him and he fell and I think he 
uh, cut his lip um, horror story. Um, and this is not only possible, it happens to many people. Do you think allulose is safe for type 1 diabetics? I read it doesn't affect glucose level, but can affect kidneys and liver. Um, allulose is an enantiomer of uh, glucose. That is, it's a mirror, it's a lineup of molecules, its structure is a mirror image of glucose, even though it has the same atoms. And um, uh, you can uh, check the internet as well as I can. You can look at labels of containers uh, of this stuff. You should try to find uh, articles in professional journals to see if it has any effect upon um, blood sugar. But one thing that it might have, in a, and by the way, uh, I took a look and um, uh, saw references to gastrointestinal disturbances. And um, I can imagine that it might affect the microbiome. And remember that the microbiome, which is the sum total of bacteria in your intestines uh, can affect uh, the immune system, the nervous system, the brain, uh, digestion. Uh, so it's very possible that it can mess up your microbiome. And I just don't know the answer to that. My guess is that, it, that if it is um, an enantiomer of glucose, it may well do that but I'm not sure. My nine-year-old daughter is diagnosed with type one. For the last eight months, she is on strict diet and without having a single unit of insulin. Is it possible to live without insulin and just by maintaining a strict diet? Not what I would recommend. Uh, I would uh, for someone that young, uh, average blood sugar is probably around 65 or 70 milligrams per deciliter. And I'm willing to bet that her blood sugars are higher than that. And uh, if you use my book, maybe diluted insulin, uh, and uh, a very smart doctor, um, uh, you could probably, and also a continuous glucose monitor, um, uh, it may be possible to keep her blood sugars level and around 65 so she doesn't have uh, beta cell burnout. Um, I also would recommend that you uh, become familiar with type one O-N-E gr grit on the internet and that you uh, listen to all my videos. I'm a 54 year old woman with type one diabetes for 41 years. When I keep my A1C around 4.8 to 4.9, find I need reading to read small print. But when my A1C goes up to around 5.1 to 2 or higher, I can read perfectly well without reading glasses. But I dislike not being able to read without reading glasses. Any thoughts? Well, uh, way back around 1967, I was walking out of my 
office in New York City. I was an employee. I was walking out for lunch and I had forgotten my glasses. I had left them up on my desk and I walk out the door and a half a block away was a street sign. It was on 28th Street and 5th Avenue, I think. And I was able to see it perfectly clearly. And I'm nearsighted. I had never been able to see that street sign without my glasses. And being trained as a scientist, I knew that something was wrong. Um, uh, physiologically, what it could have been is, uh, and that I and I assumed it had to do with high blood sugars, because um, uh, most of my urine tests were uh, four plus on glucose. Um, so I assumed that probably the refractive index um, of the uh, material in the lens of the eye had changed due to dehydration from all the peeing that I was doing. Um, well, in reality, after I went to medical school, I learned that there are a number of reasons that high blood sugars could give you better vision, one of which has to do with the fact that nearsighted people don't have spherical eyeballs they're elongated or ellipsoidal and um, the distance between the lens and the retina relates to whether the image will be in focus or not and if you're dehydrated the um, the globe shrinks and the e ellipticity diminishes so that the globe becomes more spherical and you have a more reasonable distance between the lens and the retina. So there are physiologic reasons why um, uh, your vision might be better with higher blood sugars, uh, just as mine was. So I would recommend that you keep the blood sugars as close to normal as possible. My liver enzymes are still high, but much closer to normal range since getting off metformin. Um, metformin can adversely affect the liver. It does not always adversely affect the liver. But um, if you already have a history of liver disease or kidney disease, uh, you should uh, avoid metformin. Um, so, um, I would suggest, first of all, that you read my book, Diabetes Solution, uh, and see if there are any options for treating your diabetes um, without metformin. Also, uh, uh, it certainly recommends a low carbohydrate diet. And uh, there are uh, any number of options that uh, don't have to challenge the liver, including the use of insulin, which you could discuss with your uh, physician. Must I use vials and syringes for insulin R or is it available in pen form, which I appreciate and have been using for Novolog? Well, uh, 
as most of my listeners already know, uh, the insulin pens don't deliver predictable doses. They, the injection site usually leaks. And my guess is that the reason that it leaks is because uh, you, your pressure on the uh, injection system does not come out full strength. It spins, uh, the, the uh, plunger has an elliptical groove in a, uh, a spiral groove in it. And part of the work that you're doing pushing the plunger is spinning the uh, plunger in the spiral groove. So you're not getting a high enough velocity to the stream. And the net result is that uh, some of the insulin leaks out and you never know how much. So that's why I recommend syringes uh, and vials rather than uh, pens. Now, as it happens, most diabetics who use insulin have such poor blood sugar control, in part because of the systems that they're taught, um, that they're not going to notice uh, the leakage of a few units. They're probably taking very big doses of insulin, unlike the small doses that uh, my readers would be taking, and um, their blood sugars are so abnormal anyway uh, that they're not going to notice any difference whether they take a pen or a syringe. But if you really want normal blood sugars, you're wise to use the syringes. Our 11-year-old is going to bed in a normal range, but often at around 3 a.m. would tend low and needs between 2 and 4 grams of liquid glucose. Sometimes may need it twice if had a more active day. Short of waking her up completely and brushing her teeth each time, this happens. Is there any other way to protect her teeth from cavities likely to develop due to regular sugar intake at night? We ask her to swirl some water in the mouth, but not sure this is enough. Well, I use liquid glucose. I brush my teeth twice a day. I've been using it for a number of years. I have not had any dental cavities, uh, new, new dental cavities since I've been using the liquid glucose. I guess uh, whatever fillings I have occurred many years ago before I started controlling my blood sugars. Um, I don't think that the liquid glucose is going to give her cavities. Um, that's my um, opinion. You can talk to the dentist. Um, and uh, my guess is that you should uh, stop brushing her teeth when you give her glucose. Don't make her swish her mouth with water. Uh, I don't do that, and I haven't got any new cavities. Um, uh, Leave it alone. Another thing you might want to look at is twice daily Traceba insulin, which might make her blood sugars more level overnight. Uh, well, thanks for uh, watching our May 2021 teleseminar next Teleseminar will be on Wednesday, June 30th. I look forward to seeing you then. Have a good month.